This video isn't an official refutation or review of Jacob Thompson's book, The Lord of Glory, as that would take more time than I want to invest. I want to examine a few statements from chapters 43 and 44 and provide some examples of poor scholarship from those chapters. I understand Thompson's book is not currently available for purchase in print, and according to a blog post from September 17, 2022, there is a new edition forthcoming which will include a few new chapters, additional scriptures, reformatting some things, clean up any other errors, and so forth. Hopefully the issues I'll be bringing up here have been corrected. While I'll be using the PDF version here, I'll also cite the pagination for the hard copy I have since they do differ. Now, before we dive in, I want to note something. I'm not asserting, nor do I mean to imply, that Thompson has simply quote mined from the internet. As I'll show, he hasn't simply copy and pasted. But through looking at some of the sources, his presentation of them is sloppy and has certain affinities to errors in secondary online sources. My criticism is applicable only to the examples I cover here. Don't take any errors we examine and apply that to all the other citations without examining them thoroughly first. Now, some of the statements I made in an early video about Thompson's use of James White's and Fred Sanders' books are still applicable, as those errors are present in the book. In chapter 43, Thompson cites one Cyril Richardson who says, much of the defense of the Trinity as a revealed doctrine is really an evasion of the objections that can be brought against it. And my conclusion then about the doctrine of the Trinity is that it is an artificial construct and it provides confusion rather than clarification. And while the problems with which it deals are real ones, the solutions it offers are not illuminating. It has posed for many Christians dark and mysterious statements, which are ultimately meaningless, because it does not sufficiently discriminate in its use of terms. Certainly telling statements from an orthodox Trinitarian, it would seem. However, to what extent was Richardson an orthodox Trinitarian? In Richardson's book, he gives his thesis. The historic forms of Trinitarian thinking have frequently involved artificialities, partly because different issues have been confused and partly because the terms Father, Son, and Spirit are ambiguous and their meanings tend to overlap. Within the New Testament, they signify different things and come from a varied background of religious myth and language. At the beginning of the first paragraph from page 16 and continuing through page 17, this leads to the final point. I regard it as axiomatic that the writers of the New Testament were, in one respect, trying to do the same thing we are trying to do, to find appropriate language and symbols by which to express their faith in the God who revealed himself in Jesus Christ. They used many different forms of thought and religious symbols to do this. Some proved adequate, some inadequate, and we shall have to examine the milieu of thought from which such terms as Father, Son, Spirit, Begotten, Proceeding, and so on are derived, and exactly what they meant and may mean to us. What is imperative, however, to bear in mind in this conversation is that the New Testament betrays a marked development in the understanding of the revelation in Jesus Christ, and is not all of one piece so far as the symbols used are concerned. They differ considerably from one writer to another. One of the sources of the confusion in Trinitarian theology is that the doctrine arose when the sense of the development of thought in the New Testament was lacking. Texts were torn from their contexts and misused to no small degree, and certain symbols were canonized without a full understanding of their original meaning. They were introduced into later theological schemes, not because they really fitted, but because they could not be questioned. Much of the defense of the Trinity as a revealed doctrine is really an evasion of the objections that can be brought against it. Certainly, the New Testament writers were nearer the dramatic events by which God unveiled himself in Jesus Christ than we are, and surely the measure of their inspiration was greater than that of later theologians. Yet it is equally true that we profit from a benefit denied to them, that is, 2,000 years of Christian reflection and experience. In consequence, while we must listen in humility to what they say, we must continue trying to express in ever clearer and more satisfactory ways the message they recorded. Indeed, the doctrine of the Trinity itself is part of that process. It is not a doctrine specifically to be found in the New Testament. It is a creation of the 4th century church. There are elements in the New Testament which point toward it, and others which point away from it, as we shall see later. But the important thing is this. The background of thought in Judaism and Hellenistic culture, whence the New Testament symbols for understanding Jesus Christ were drawn, was not necessarily the best. 
This background has bequeathed to theology innumerable problems, and the recent attempts to demythologize the New Testament, while they may be unduly radical and unacceptable, do point to the constant need for us to weigh the value of New Testament symbolism and assess its adequacy. The modern study of the Bible both forbids us to deal with its texts out of context, as many church fathers did, and also enriches our grasp of its message. We then, like the New Testament writers, seek to express as adequately as possible the nature of this God who disclosed himself in Jesus Christ, and we should not feel bound by their particular symbolism if we find it at times detracts from or confuses the basic message it sought to convey. On page 24, this is what lies behind their use in John and Paul, though it is to be admitted that these authors are far from consistent in following the pattern through. This is due to many factors, such as the ambiguity of the term father and the reluctance of Paul to regard the son as fully God. He views him as a heavenly being in the form of God, with only a temporary authority, which he finally yields to the Father. Now, proceeding the final quote Thompson gave regarding the Trinity producing confusion rather than clarification, Richardson said in the same chapter that when we say Son, we refer to this relation between the Heavenly Father and Jesus of Nazareth. It is a relation within the terms of the Incarnation. When we say Spirit, we refer to God's dynamic action. We think of God's creative energy as it manifests itself in various ways and as he himself is present in his world. Following the given quote, he states, There is no necessary threeness in the Godhead. I could quote even more, but this should make it clear that Richardson was not an Orthodox Christian. Even Millard Erickson, in his book, God in Three Persons, A Contemporary Interpretation of the Trinity, which Jacob cites on page 348, uses Richardson's book as a primary presenter of the objection to the biblical teaching of the Trinity and says that this book is cited frequently by process theologians in their reconstruction of the biblical teaching about the Trinity. Having read Erickson's and Richardson's books, Thompson should be aware of Richardson's views and errors and the responses to them. Later, he continues, James White, later on in the same book, quotes a man by the name of Louis Burkhoff from his work, Systematic Theology. He says the second foundation to the Trinity consisting of three persons or substances. Now, Thompson is paraphrasing White and Burkhoff, but he nevertheless misunderstands them. White actually uses the word subsistences, which is different and has a different meaning. Later, Thompson says again, They saw the clear distinctions that are most certainly there in the Godhead, but did not know how to reconcile them. So with the help of their pagan influences, they came to the conclusion of three different persons or substances, hypostases. In his section on the Incarnation, Thompson writes, This is another one of those problems with the flesh of God kind of things. That second paragraph of the quote gives a brief self-definition of how these guys define what they call the Incarnation. This is where another made-up term is used known as the hypostatic union. This scholarly term is used to summarize that the Son of God, the second person in Trinitarian definitions, dwelling physically with man on the earth, had the nature of God and a corruptible nature, thereby making him the God-man, as they would say. His response to this? He says the reading Haas in 1 Timothy 3.16 aids Trinitarians. The majority reading Theos was obviously unknown to the majority of Trinitarians and defenders of Chalcedonian Christology until very lately. And this is all he really says on the matter. He then goes on to the core of the Trinitarian doctrine. What it truly teaches is there are three spirits that no one can see except God the Son, because he took on the nature of a man, hence the hypostatic union. This is why the Catholic Catechism and other Trinitarian writers make use of the word hypostasis, where all the members of the Trinity are the same substance. We've responded to this false claim of three spirits before. He continues, If Trinitarians as a whole teach that man is tripart, it would create a problem for the persons of the Trinity, because what then would you do with a soul? This is where some of the Benny Hinn logic comes into play, because Hinn recognized man's construction, applied that to the persons of the Trinity, and made them each have a body, soul, and spirit as a man. So for most Trinitarians, they avoid this as to not fall into that logic of the nine-god Trinity, which then calls for these teachers to preach bipartism for man. The fact is, there have been Trinitarians who have held a bipartite and tripartite view of man long before Benny Hinn's ravings were broadcast to the world. It has nothing to do with avoiding his foolishness. He then gets back to the Incarnation. There are traditionally two schools of thought when it comes to the Incarnation event. The two groups are known as Eternal Sonship 
and incarnational sonship. Both of them deal with the role of the second person of the Trinity. Both of them are heretical, but incarnational sonship is even worse. He recreates a chart laying out the differences between the two views and ends with, both groups are predicated on believing the Trinity, so both of them are heretical. But just by judging the incarnational side, it is very heretical and even more unscriptural than the eternal side. It's been a long time since I went through the whole book and made notes, so I might have forgotten. But this would be the ideal place for him to lay out in what regard the Father is the Father of the Son, and in what regard the Son is the Son of the Father. He clearly doesn't hold to a literal or univocal father-son relation. Is this just equivocal language in Scripture? We aren't told here. It would seem the only options are temporal sonship or atemporal sonship, and he says both are heretical. Perhaps if it's not a real sonship, it's merely a conceptual one. His statement of two schools of thought regarding the Incarnation points to some ignorance of the historical Christological heresies and theories such as Apollinarianism, Nestorianism, Eutychianism, Canonic theology, etc. In the next chapter, he claims that this chapter will conclusively show that the Trinity concept of the Lord is totally absent from God's Word, but that the Trinity perception was a heavily scrutinized belief when presented, and in fact was nothing new but had already existed in various forms and theories. Thompson also states, contrary to many Trinitarians, the Trinity is nowhere found in the Bible. It is a philosophical invention created in the late 2nd century. This is simply untrue, because while the word Trinity, nor an explicit doctrinal formulation of the Trinity, is found in Scripture, all the foundational, necessary points are there. At a basic level, there's one God, the Father is identified as God, the Son is identified as God, and the Holy Ghost is identified as God. And these three are distinguished, and not only to our conceptions. Any system which attempts to articulate what Scripture reveals to us by God, and not be contradictory, is necessarily a philosophical one. Next he says, One of those men was Tertullian. Tertullian is responsible for creating the early foundations for the doctrine. In his writings against Praxius is the first time the word Trinity is used. This work is dated to be written in 180 AD. First, Tertullian did not create the early foundations for the doctrine, as those foundations are found in Scripture. Second, Adversus Praxian is not the first work in which we find the word Trinity, nor a formulation of the concept. Third, Thompson states the date is 180 AD. The scholarly works I can find place it no earlier than 208 AD in the Antinicene Fathers, or 213 in Encyclopedia Britannica. If we are generous, it is 20 years later than stated in Thompson's work. Now concerning the word Trinity or the articulation of that understanding, in Theophilus' To Autolycus, Book 2, Chapter 15, dated 8180-192, he says, For the sun is a type of God and the moon of man, and as the sun far surpasses the moon in power and glory, so far does God surpass man. And as the sun remains ever full, never becoming less, so does God always abide perfect, being full of all power and understanding and wisdom and immortality and all good. But the moon wanes monthly and in a manner dies, being a type of man. Then it is born again and is crescent for a pattern of the future resurrection. In like manner also the three days which were before the illuminaries are types of the Trinity, of God and his word and his wisdom. Notes from the Antinicene Father set state after Trinity, Triodos, the earliest use of this word trinity. It seems to have been used by this writer in his lost works also. And, as a learned friend suggests, the use he makes of it is familiar. He does not lug it in as something novel. Types of the trinity, he says, illustrating an accepted word, not introducing a new one. And at the conclusion of the cited section, an eminent authority says, it is certain that according to the notions of Theophilus, God, his word, and his wisdom constitute a trinity, and it should seem a trinity of persons. He notes the title Sophia is here assigned to the Holy Spirit, although he himself elsewhere gives this title to the Son, as is more usual with the fathers. In Athanagoras's A Plea for the Christians, chapter 10, which is dated AD 177-180, to that we are not atheists, therefore, seeing that we acknowledge one God, uncreated, eternal, invisible, impassable, incomprehensible, illimitable, who is apprehended by the understanding only and the reason, who is encompassed by light and beauty and spirit and power ineffable, 
by whom the universe has been created through his logos and set in order and is kept in being, I have sufficiently demonstrated. I say his logos, for we acknowledge also a son of God. Nor let anyone think it ridiculous that God should have a son. For though the poets in their fictions represent the gods as no better than men, our mode of thinking is not the same as theirs concerning either God the Father or the Son. But the Son of God is the Logos of the Father, in idea and in operation. For after the pattern of him and by him were all things made, the Father and the Son being one, and the Son being in the Father, and the Father in the Son, in oneness and power of spirit, the understanding and reason of the Father is the Son of God. But if, in your surpassing intelligence, it occurs to you to inquire what is meant by the Son, I will state it briefly that he is the first product of the Father, not as having been brought into existence. For from the beginning God, who is the eternal mind, had the Logos in himself, being from eternity instinct with Logos. But inasmuch as he came forth to be the idea and energizing power of all material things, which lay like a nature without attributes, and an inactive earth, the grosser particles being mixed up with the lighter. The prophetic spirit also agrees with our statements. The Lord, it says, made me the beginning of his ways to his works. The Holy Spirit himself also, which operates in the prophets, we assert to be an effluence of God flowing from him and returning back again like a beam of the sun. Who then would not be astonished to hear men speak of God the Father, and of God the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, who declare both their power and union, and their distinction and order, called atheists? Nor is our teaching in what relates to the divine nature confined to these points. But we recognize also a multitude of angels and ministers, whom God the Maker and Framer of the world distributed and appointed to their several posts by his Logos to occupy themselves about the elements and the heavens and the world and the things in it and the goodly ordering of them all. Without delving into the details regarding Athanagoras' view of the sun's generation in light of later controversies, the point is that Thompson's claim regarding the earliest known use of Trinity is incorrect, and his claim regarding Tertullian's creation of the foundations of the doctrine is incorrect as well. He then goes on to say, Tertullian openly admits that he is not in the majority, and his beliefs were scrutinized by those of his day. He cites the beginning of chapter 3 of Against Praxius, which reads, The simple indeed, I will not call them unwise and unlearned, who always constitute the majority of believers, are startled at the dispensation of the three in one, on the ground that their very rule of faith withdraws them from the world's plurality of gods to the one only true God, not understanding that although he is only one God, he must yet be believed in his own economia. Thompson then states, Right there, proof positive from Tertullian's own words, he admits to not being the majority. That right there should speak high volumes to a Trinitarian out there. Here we got the guy who coined the term Trinity, and he is admitting that what he believed and preached was not the majority and was criticized. That should tell you something. It should tell you that the Trinity doctrine is nothing but a farce and a lie. Contrary to his understanding of the cited statement, Tertullian is not saying that this doctrine is a minority view, which wouldn't necessarily make it incorrect anyway, but that the majority of believers are simple, though he does not call them unwise or unlearned. Tertullian neither coined the term, nor says his view was the minority view. Again, even if it was the minority view, this would not make it false, since Thompson's view can hardly be found throughout history. And he would not conclude his own view false on those grounds. We then go on. If Catholics and other Trinitarians want to put so much weight and reverence into Tertullian, then why don't we take a look at some quotes long before Tertullian arrived on the scene? I'll give the quotes as he does, then review Holmes' translation in the Apostolic Fathers. We have Ignatius to the Magnesians, chapter 15. Fare ye well in the harmony of God, ye who have obtained the inseparable Spirit, who is Jesus Christ. Ignatius to the Ephesians, the Salutation being united and elected through the true passion by the will of the Father and Jesus Christ, our God, abundant happiness through Jesus Christ and his undefiled grace. Thompson's next quote is from chapter 19, but he cites this merely as I bid. Hence, every kind of magic was destroyed, and every bond of wickedness disappeared. Ignorance was removed, and the old kingdom abolished, God himself being manifested in human form for the renewal of eternal life. We return to Ignatius to the Magnesians, chapter 8. 
On this account also they were persecuted, being inspired by his grace to fully convince the unbelieving that there is one God who has manifested himself by Jesus Christ his Son, who is his eternal word, not proceeding forth from silence, and who in all things pleased him that sent him. There is a textual variant on not regarding the word proceeding from silence. Polycarp to the Philippians chapter 6. If then we entreat the Lord to forgive us, we ought also ourselves to forgive. For we are before the eyes of our Lord and God, and we must all appear at the judgment seat of Christ, and must everyone give an account of himself. Are these quotes sufficient to prove Thompson's contention that the writings of Ignatius and Polycarp, who knew the Apostle John, actually are saying things about the Godhead that line up perfectly with the Word of God? Their language certainly reflects that of the New Testament. What has not been demonstrated is that they intended to communicate Thompson's idea of the Godhead in their use of the New Testament language. Next, Thompson moves on to such statements as, one begins to realize this idea of a trinity, a three-in-one, is nothing new. As a matter of fact, pagan cultures, religions, and mythologies have their own triad gods. This can be traced as far back as the first Babylon, where the trinity concept truly originated from. The original trinity from Babylon was Nimrod, Semiramis, and Baal. And we're not going to look at every example given, because if you start to examine most of them, you'll find too much dissimilarity to the doctrine of the Trinity for it to qualify as an early form of it. Typically, these are variations of tritheism or modalism. Now, Thompson quotes Helena Blavatsky's protege, Marie Sinclair, as stating, It is generally, although erroneously supposed, that the doctrine of the Trinity is of Christian origin. Nearly every nation of antiquity possessed a similar doctrine. The early Catholic theologian St. Jerome testifies unequivocally, all the ancient nations believed in the Trinity. Now, Thompson cites this as coming from Old Truths in a New Light, page 382. The only edition of the book I have found online has it on page 381 and reads, nearly every nation of antiquity possessed a similar doctrine. St. Jerome testifies unequivocally, all the ancient nations believed in the Trinity. There are several websites that give the quote in a manner closer to how Thompson presents it. The issues are, of course, that first, the page reference in Thompson's book is off, which either would not occur if he utilized the available scan of the work, or it's possible there is another edition with different pagination that he used, which I'm unaware of. Second, Thompson's use of the early Catholic theologian in brackets matches other online sources which also lists the seemingly erroneous page number, while the works cited does not include this information in brackets. He also gives on page 373 another citation from Sinclair's work as stating, The Puranas, one of the Hindu Bibles of more than 3,000 years ago, contain the following passage, O ye three lords, know that I recognize only one God. Inform me therefore which of you is the true divinity, that I may address to him alone my adorations. The three gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Siva, or Shiva, becoming manifest to him, replied, Learn, O devotee, that there is no real distinction between us. What to you appears such is only the semblance. The single being appears under three forms, by the acts of creation, preservation, and destruction, but he is one. Hence the triangle was adopted by all the ancient nations as a symbol of the deity. Three was considered among all the pagan nations as the chief of the mystical numbers, because as Aristotle remarks, it contains within itself a beginning, a middle, and an end. Hence, we find it designating some of the attributes of almost all the pagan gods. We have the cited as coming from pages 382 and 383. In reality, this comes from 381 and 382, but as before, it's possible he's using a different version of the work. Online sources have the bracketed, or Shiva, while the original does not. It would seem that if you're going to cite these places you would continue through a few others in the chapter. Why? Well, next up is the thunderbolt of Jove was three-forked. The scepter of Neptune was a trident. Kerberos, the dog of Pluto, was three-headed. In Freemasonry, the number three is the most important and universal in its application of all the mystic numbers. On the next page, no writer ever avowed or taught a belief in any tenet of religious faith more fully or plainly than Plato sets forth the doctrine of the Trinity in his Phaedon, written 400 years B.C. His first term for the Trinity was in Greek, 1. Agathon, the supreme god or father, 2. The Logos, which is the Greek word for the word, and 3. Psyche, 
which the Greek lexicon defines to mean soul, spirit, or ghost. In this exposition of the Trinity adopted by the Greeks and published 400 years B.C., we have the identical doctrine of the Christian church. Wouldn't this be juicy stuff to help a thesis of Thompson's chapter? On page 372, Thompson quotes Nejovit's Egypt Trunk of the Tree, Part 2, as reading, The hymn to Amon decreed that no god came into being before him, Amon, and that all gods are three, Amon, Re, and Ta, and there is no second to them. Hidden is his name Amon, he is Re in face, and his body is Ta. This is a statement of Trinity, the three chief gods of Egypt subsumed into one of them, Amon. Clearly, the concept of organic unity within plurality got an extraordinary boost with this formulation. Theologically, in a crude form, it came strikingly close to the later Christian form of plural Trinitarian monotheism. Now, comparing Thompson's quote, the online source, and the original work, the online source has added italics, which Thompson's quote does not. His citation of it in that regard matches the original work. However, Thompson's quote matches in three deviations found on this site. Parentheses instead of brackets, the ellipses, and the absence of a concluding quotation mark. Amon is in parentheses on the website and in Thompson's book, while it is in brackets in the original. In Thompson's version, Nijovitz provides two quotes related to the hymn of Amon. No god came into being before him, Amon, and all gods are three, Amon, Re, and Ta, and there is no second to them. Hidden is his name as Amon. He is Ray in face, and his body is Ta. In the source, Jovitz has a third. The use of ellipses in Thompson's quotation misses the first part, and the missing quotation mark obscures this. The missing portion reads, As John Wilson, 1899-1976, has pointed out, the text does not say, There is no fourth to them. This is a statement of Trinity, the three chief gods of Egypt subsumed into one of them, Amon. This error is present both in the online quote and Thompson's presentation. Before we end, at the bottom of page 372, Thompson states, Sometimes the Egyptian trinity is referred to as Isis Horus Set. These form the initials IHS, which is the symbol of the Jesuit order of Catholicism. And I'll concede. The first letters of the English words Isis Horus Set coincide with the Latin Christogram IHS. However, in order for this to work, several facts have to be ignored. One, the Christogram's use in Latin dates from the 6th century. Second, since the earlier form of majuscule sigma in Greek is lunate and looks like C, IHC has also been used. Third, since I and J in Latin were used somewhat interchangeably until the 17th century, it can also be JHC or JHS. And fourth, H was used in Latin because of its visual similarity to the Greek majuscule eta. Thinking this Christogram is actually referring to Isis horse set is silliness. Now there's much more we could go through, but it would expand this video exponentially. To recap, Thompson's use of sources is uncritical. In some quotes, errors are present, which are also in online presentations, and these would be eliminated if more care were taken with original sources. This seems to be a common shortcoming in Thompson's use of sources, which I have demonstrated elsewhere.